Well, good afternoon. <laughs> National Assembly of Wales is now in session. And before I call the First Minister, it gives me great pleasure to announce that on, in accordance with Standing Order 26.75, the Qualification Wales Bill was given royal assent on the 5th of August. Yay. And now we move to item one, which is questions to the First Minister. And first this afternoon is Mike Hedges. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on the GCSE results of schools that fall under the Schools Challenge Cymru programme? Yes, I'm delighted that around two-thirds of the 40 Schools Challenge Cymru schools have reported an improvement in the number of their pupils gaining five or more good GCSEs this summer. We await, of course, the provisional results later this month, uh, but this indicates a strong start to the programme. Can I thank the First Minister for that response? Uh, following the huge success of the Schools Challenge programme in London, I have been a strong advocate of Schools Challenge Cymru. Will the First Minister join me, with me in congratulating Pentra Havard, one of the Schools Challenge Cymru schools in Swans East, on their hugely improved GCSE results? Yes, I have joined the uh, member in congratulating Pentra Havard. Uh, their best ever set of GCSE results. Good news for the teachers and the pupils who, of course, should be uh, congratulated. We know that other schools have reported good progress as well, including uh, Tonopandi Community College and uh, Blackwood uh, Comprehensive. And I think it's right to say that we await the official results with optimism. Susie Davis. Uh, uh, Deal Clawith, uh, good afternoon, First Minister. I'm sure you join with me in congratulating all those uh, young people who achieved good GCSE results uh, this year and commiserate with those who perhaps might have been disappointed. Are you in a position yet to tell us how well those children who have been identified as uh, uh, more able and talented, how well they've done in schools in disadvantaged areas which don't benefit from the Schools Challenge Cymru programme? Well, as we know, we await the uh, provisional results, but we are confident uh, that education is moving in the right direction in Wales. We've seen the results from Schools Challenge Cymru schools, we've seen the results across Wales, and we know that her party would cut education spending by 20%. Yeah. Yeah. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, your government, First Minister, has pledged that you will close the attainment gap between children who receive free school meals in the Schools Challenge Cymru schools. But a fortnight ago, in a written statement, your Education Minister reduced that target from 37% of these children to reach grade C GCSE to 34% for the school's categorisation. Having missed a target that the government itself wasn't ambitious enough, the government has then changed that target. Every time you fail to deliver, your answer is to change the target. When is there a need for change of government? It's not true to say that we have reduced the targets because 37% remains the comprehensive target as regards the number of pupils as regards the number of pupils that receive school free school meals and to ensure that they get five good GCSEs ultimately and that's the target for 2017 Angela Burns uh, thank you presiding officer Good afternoon, First Minister. Will you make a statement on Welsh Government measures to tackle child sexual abuse in Wales? Yes, we're working with stakeholders to support continued improvement in professional practice in tackling child sexual abuse and exploitation. And the National Independent Safeguarding Board will further strengthen the safeguarding framework and uh, so it will support improvements in practice across Wales. Thank you. Uh, First Minister, Wales is the only home nation that does not keep track of how long a child has either a child protection plan in place or been on or is on a child protection register. Being on the register or having a plan in place is a key indicator of a child at risk, but the information your government currently holds is a year-end snapshot and does not measure a child's ex uh, length of exposure to risk. If we don't have this important measure in place, First Minister, how is your government going to be able to ascertain whether or not we have children simply drifting in the system without having a concrete resolution to the situation they find themselves in? Well, what I would argue that the uh, Social Services and Wellbeing Act further strengthens the existing safeguarding arrangements for children. It does introduce a new duty to report uh, to the local authority and it does define a child at risk. We know that uh, other organisations such as health uh, services, police uh, service and probation services will be required to inform the local authority where they have reasonable cause to believe that a child is at risk. 
following such notification, local authorities will exercise their existing duty to investigate under the current uh, Children Act. So uh, my argument would be that the Social Services Act strengthens the uh, provision that's available for children who are at risk, and that is something I'm sure the members will welcome. We now move to questions from the party leaders. And first this afternoon, we have the leader of Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood. First Minister, what steps is the Welsh Government taking to make itself more accountable for outcomes in the NHS? Well, uh, outcomes are something on which I am questioning, and indeed the Health Minister on a regular basis in this chamber. First Minister, you s have said that the uh, next election is all going to be about your record in office, and I couldn't agree more. That's why I want to ask you today about your decision not only to drop the eight-minute ambulance target, but your decision not to publish the relevant figures as well. Now, on the 23rd of May 2013, the Health Minister, in a written statement, said, I understand the importance of maintaining information relating to the eight-minute response as a comparator of performance with other UK nations. A month later, on the floor of this chamber, he gave his, his assurance that the data on the eight-minute response times would be available for scrutiny. Why was the Health Minister's assurance overturned? Well, first of all, of course, the reason why uh, these changes are taking place is after discussions with the ambulance, the paramedics themselves, and indeed with the Wales Ambulance Trust, and indeed with the local health boards. England is changing. Uh, the way it actually measures ambulance response times and we're not going to be in a position where because of the way we've historically done it we're in a worse position than England purely because of the way we count clearly we know that even though this isn't a competition between Wales and England it's important that people are able to have broadly comparative uh, methods by which they can compare ambulance response times that's exactly what we've done First Minister, I agree that the target in itself, uh, the eight-minute response time, might well be too simplistic as a target. But it's unacceptable to stop publishing data just because yeah. it makes yeah. you look yeah. bad. Yeah. Now, the eight-minute target may well be imperfect, but people have the right to compare performance and scrutinise outcomes. They have the right to hold you to account. So what makes you think that you should be allowed to get away with hiding your failings? Well, first of all, she argues, she complains about the uh, change in the eight-minute um, response time and then says she doesn't agree with it anyway. I mean, she can't have it both ways. And secondly, they, we are not, not publishing data. The data will be available, as is always the case, and the data will be available for, available for scrutiny by this National Assembly. I do not see how she can say that somehow data is not going to be published in the future. Clearly, it will. We now move to the Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Artie Davis. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, do you still think Jeremy Corbyn is an unusual choice as leader of the Labour Party? Because, obviously, in the election campaign, you said you thought he was an unusual choice, but your health minister gave him a glowing endorsement. Yes. Uh, well, as the First Minister of Wales and the leader of Welsh Labour, I'm here to answer questions regarding the Welsh Government, not anyone else. <laughs> as I understand it, you regard it quite important, that relationship between the leader in Westminster and the leader of the Welsh Labour Party, which is Jeremy Corbyn, not your good self. Uh, you are meeting him tomorrow. You are meeting him tomorrow, and I hope very much that you will be talking to him about your dreadful health statistics you promised a government that was going to deliver. At the end of July, 443,000 people were waiting to start treatment here in Wales. 443,000. What your government and your time as First Minister has delivered is a doubling of waiting times here in Wales. What will you be telling Jeremy Corbyn about your record here in Wales? Well, I don't have a London obsession like him. I don't take orders from London as he does. Uh, his party, as, as we've seen before, he waits a couple of days before he says anything, so he gets the green light from his masters in London. Let me tell him something. We have delivered a good health service. We have made sure that his spending goes on health, despite the 10 percent cut in our budget from his party, about which he has done and said absolutely nothing. And we will not cut education by 20 percent. We will not cut local government by 12 percent. We will not cut spending on job creation by 30 percent. All the things that he wants to do. We will always stand up for Wales, fight for Wales. It's a shame he's so mute. Yeah. We will protect the health budget, something yeah. that you have not done and failed to do, First Minister. 
443,000 people are waiting to start order, treatment in Wales, order. First Minister. That's double the number that were awaiting when you became First Minister. Yeah. That's what you have delivered for the people of Wales and the patients who are waiting to start their treatment. Jeremy Corbyn, when he was in Cardiff, lamented the devastating health cuts that you'd put on the Welsh NHS budget. He's lamenting that. Will you be apologising? Will you be apologising for those cuts when you meet him tomorrow, First Minister? He was talking about the cuts imposed by your party. Oh. Don't try and use the comments out of, uh, out of context. I mean, the one thing about the Leader of the Opposition is he doesn't get it, does he? When the Tories ran Wales, <laughs> waiting times were years. Yeah. Years. We remember the 90s. We remember when they were in charge and people were waiting two, three years for cataract operations as a matter of course. So he can't lecture us in terms of, in terms of waiting times. He sits there and says nothing when, for example, the justice system is being destroyed by charges imposed in criminal trials that make the justice system look like nothing more than a racket. He said nothing about the closures of magistrates' courts and county courts across with absolutely nothing whatsoever. He says nothing when we see cuts imposed on the Welsh budget. We do know, in fairness, in fairness, be honest, he has said he cut education spending by 20 per cent. We've gone through this, 30 per cent job creation, 12 per cent cut in local government, massive increase in the council tax as a result of that. They've been honest and said that. It's a real shame. But unlike those of us on these benches, he cannot bring himself to think for himself and stand up for Wales. 443,000. It's not often I say I can't hear Andrew Archie Davis, but I couldn't today. So can we just tone it down a little? We now move to the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, Kirsty Williams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, could you outline what actions and steps that your government has taken to improve delayed transfers of care over the past two years? Well, you've seen, of course, the uh, figures improve. That's because we've made sure that social services spending uh, has been uh, protected. Uh, and we know that the health and social services budget is intimately linked to trying to divorce one from the other is unrealistic. And we know that health and social services spending is 8% higher in Wales per head than is the case in England. It's clearly not working, First Minister, and I don't know which figures that you've been looking at. So far, every month of 2015 has seen a year-on-year -year increase in the number of people stuck unnecessarily in a hospital bed in Wales. Three out of those seven months for which figures are available show an increase of more than 20% on the number of delayed transfers of care last year. What impact do you think that those delayed transfers of care will have on the ability of the NHS to admit, hospital pa uh, admit patients to hospital wards in a timely fashion. Well, nobody wishes to see uh, people staying in hospital for longer than is uh, necessary. We know that the number of patients experiencing a delayed transfer of care has fallen over time. It is right to say that recently numbers have fluctuated. Uh, there have been reductions. There have not been consistent reductions that I accept. I can say the Deputy Minister has been meeting with senior officials of health boards and their local authorities to discuss the reasons for delayed transfers of care and the actions those bodies are putting in place to bring about a sustained reduction in the number and extent of them. First Minister, you are truly stretching the realms of credibility when you say that these numbers are improving. January, up 22% on January last year. February, up 20% on February last year. July of this year, up 10% of July of last year. July of this year, 503 patients were in beds when they didn't need to be there. That's almost the entire bed capacity of the Wrexham Myler hospital it's simply not credible for you to stand there and say the numbers are getting better the evidence is different and you've repeated it again today you have repeated it again today your defense long used by you and the health minister to explain poor performance against other targets in the nhs has been to say it's because you're spending money on social services now these delayed transfers of care suggest that it's not cutting the mustard it's not making a difference the met office has already given a warning that this winter could be a particularly harsh and severe one what immediate steps no more discussions with the deputy minister but what immediate steps will you take to ensure that bed capacity in the welsh nhs is maximized so that people are not left languishing in a bed or finding it difficult to be admitted from either the community or a packed out A&E department. 
Well, first of all, there are always winter plans, plans in place, and you will know last year those, those winter plans were in place. And despite the um, challenges that the NHS in Wales faced in December and January, we did not see uh, the same uh, scenes as we saw in English A&E departments, where tents were being erected in car parks to see people. But it was tough. There's no question about that. And we know that in the winter we do see um, uh, admissions to A&E spike, but our LHBs are ready uh, for that. Now she has tried, she has used figures in a particular way. We know that the, the delayed transfers of care have come down, not consistently down every month, but the trend is downwards, and that's because we believe, uh, well, we know that we've protected social services spending, uh, particularly as we see what's happening in England where the exact opposite is happening. And the reason why we do that is because you can't divorce health and social services spending. Uh, what's happened in England is that spending has been taken out of uh, social services, and now, of course, we see the consequences. We now move back to questions on the paper, and this question three is Joyce Watson. Del Llawydd, will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's public procurement policy? Well, in June, we issued a revised Wales procurement policy statement, making clear our expectations for public bodies and how performance will be measured and monitored. And the new powers that came into effect in August will enable us to regulate on procurement matters, uh, further strengthening that policy statement. Uh, I thank you for that answer, First Minister. The Cross-Party Construction Group published a report led by industry on the procurement process at the end of last term. Uh, you have just uh, announced that we have uh, received new powers to regulate in this particular area. Um, with public sector contracts worth £4.3 billion, that is a massive opportunity to boost homegrown businesses. How will the new powers benefit the businesses on the ground, particularly in my uh, area, uh, First Minister, and help uh, small businesses? Welsh Ministers now have the ability to regulate on procurement uh, matters, including strengthening the WPPS, and Valley Wales officials are developing a plan for <coughs> utilising those new uh, powers. Uh, there was a refreshed statement, as I mentioned, on the 9th of June. Uh, we are enabling our local suppliers to increase their share of procurement in Wales, and 65% of the volume of contract awards published on, the, on sell to Wales is won by Wales-based suppliers. Paul Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you may have seen the BBC programme recently, The Farmer and the Food Chain, and in that particular programme, many were calling on the Welsh Government to ensure that there was significant change in terms of procurement contracts for schools, hospitals and public bodies in Wales in order to ensure that local producers are treated more fairly. So in light of this, can you tell us what discussions the Welsh Government have had with local authorities on food procurement processes to ensure that local food producers do have an opportunity to sell their produce to local authorities and, of course, to other public bodies? Well, in a way, it's the food sector that led on this. I remember that uh, more than 10 years ago, ensuring that beef from Wales is used in the health service. But the problem was not that there was any problem with the health boards themselves as regards purchasing Welsh food, but at the time there weren't sufficient number of companies who could ensure that there was a continuous supply of food available. And then, of course, after that, Welsh beef went into the uh, health service. Carmarthenshire Council have been very innovative on this with their procurement officers there in order to ensure that local producers do have the opportunities to bid for contracts and of course we see that happening throughout the whole of Wales and as I said with some contracts now the majority are actually won by local companies. You're with? Uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. I certainly welcome the fact that new regulations on public procurement are to be brought forward next year. But would the First Minister acknowledge that we can't afford to wait a second longer before we see action happening in this area? There are too many companies that I speak to, including one company that I'll be visiting tomorrow morning, as it happens, who feel that they are being excluded from competing for public 
contracts. Now, I'm pleased to hear Joyce Watson on the Labour backbenches saying that she agrees that this Labour government has failed to make significant ground in terms of public procurement. We can't afford any further delays. Well, that's not what she said, to be perfectly fair to her. That's not what she said at all. We have been extremely successful as regards securing more contracts and ensuring that more contracts are won by Welsh companies. 55%, for example, of the annual spend on procurement is, is once again won by Welsh companies, and that's a substantial number. So there's been a significant increase in the number of companies that are able to secure business by winning contracts through the procurement system here in Wales. And once we have new min new powers as ministers, we must ensure that that improvement continues. Uh, presenting officer, I declare an interest that my husband is a partner in a farming business. Uh, last week, First Minister, I joined graziers on the Epint mm. and served lamb rolls to the troops that were training on that particular uh, facility as part of the NFU's Back British Farming campaign, as well as doing what you can to increase public procurement of Welsh uh, produce, including Welsh lamb, given that the market price is so bad at the moment, would you commit to writing to the MOD uh, to ensure that all government departments, whether based here uh, from the Welsh Government or indeed the Westminster Government, do their bit to support the usage of Welsh food, British food, in public sector contracts? Uh, yes, I will do that. Uh, it is something that's been done before, uh, some years ago. Uh, the MOD is not the easiest department to deal with in terms of getting a straight answer on anything. Uh, but uh, certainly I will write along the uh, terms that she has suggested, and I'm certainly uh, more than happy to join her in, uh, and indeed the farming unions, in, in encouraging more people to eat uh, produce and wealth. Question four, Anne Jones. Thank you. Will the First Minister provide an update on Wales' response to the Syrian refugee crisis? Yes, Presiding Officer, I understand you've given permission for questions four and six to be grouped. Uh, yes, I will lead a summit on Thursday to bring together the key agencies and service providers to develop a coordinated Wales-wide approach. Um, thank you very much for that, First Minister. And can I thank you for your very strong leadership and being the first leader from one of the nations of the UK to actually stake out and say that we will take, play our part to help those people fleeing from, from Syria and from war-torn Syria. And will you uh, join me in, in um, also sharing with the Bishop of St Asaph, who is very, very vocal on the fact that we should all be playing our part and that we should be now finding practical ways in which we can move forward to keep that welcome for those people. Wales has a proud and a, and a really good tradition of being a multicultural country. And under your leadership, I'm sure we will be able to play our part, if not others that will want to join us. Uh, well, I thank the member for her comments. I thought it was important to uh, make a statement as First Minister on this, despite the fact it wasn't a devolved issue, but sometimes uh, and, and other parties have, have uh, said the same thing so this is not a, a party political issue at all to my, to my mind but it is important to say these things the, the the purpose of thursday is to make sure that we can talk uh, with local authorities and with other agencies those bodies that will be responsible for resetting people to talk through with them to understand with them what the challenges are what needs to be done uh, what uh, help we can give them uh, in order to make sure that uh, when we are looking to resettle people that we can all work together in order to uh, make sure that is done as effectively as possible. Jeff Cuthbert. Uh, th thank you. Will the First Minister join with me in congratulating Caerphilly ICE, the Caerphilly Observer and Bargoid YMCA in my constituency and countless other people across Wales for their help in collecting clothes and other material benefits for those unfortunate people trapped in this terrible humanitarian crisis? <laughs> Will he also agree with me that the people of Wales are far ahead of the UK government in terms of compassion and their sense of duty. Yeah, I would, uh, and I certainly join with the member in offering my congratulations. I regret the fact that the Prime Minister uh, was laggardly uh, in his response. You cannot bury your head in the sand uh, when people are risking their lives on unseaworthy craft in order to cross to uh, a place that they see as a place of safety. People are naturally going to, to do that. We all saw the shocking pictures of um, young children who had drowned 
as a result of making that uh, crossing. Simply ignoring it is uh, not going to make the issue go away. Uh, and I do believe it's important, and there are others in the chamber, uh, in other parties who said the same thing, uh, that we in Wales are able to offer a welcome for people as we see one of the greatest humanitarian crises to hit the continent of Europe since the end of the Second World War. Leanne Wood. First Minister, back last April, I asked you if you were prepared to support a cross-party approach here in Wales to ensure that we played our part in alleviating what was dubbed at that point in time uh, the Mediterranean refugee crisis. Sadly, that crisis has escalated and now greater numbers of refugees are seeking safety in Europe. Do you support a quota system for the UK and in turn a quota system for the nations of the UK and will that matter be on the agenda of your summit on Thursday? I do support a quota system. Uh, I do think that, um, I, I, in principle I support the idea of a quota system for each nation uh, as well. Uh, I think Thursday is not so much about um, looking at agreeing on the number of people we should take. I think that's an artificial um, uh, level, especially given what's happened in the past week or two. But I do think it's important that we are ready uh, across the public sector in Wales to be able to resettle people when that time comes. I'm, I'm not sure of the view of the UK government. It seems to be that they will spend aid money on helping people in the council countries like Lebanon rather than those people who uh, would seek resettlement in the UK. I'm unclear on that. Um, I see the leadership that Germany has given. I also see the, the, the difficulties that, that Germany has faced um, uh, in, in the flow of people into Germany itself. But the one thing we do know, as Europeans, is that people will flee war in order to find somewhere that's peaceful. And we're seeing it now in large numbers. We can't ignore that. We can't pretend that somehow the UK is cut off from the rest of the world in that way. And it's important, and I, I thank her for her comments as well, uh, in terms of what she said, uh, that we actually say, look, we have a great humanitarian crisis. We are human beings. We must find a way to help and resettle people who are in dire need. Mohammed Ashgar. Presiding officer, First Minister, Newport is one of the UK's design designated dispersal areas for asylum seekers in Wales, and the number of asylum seekers in the city has doubled in the last three years. Will the First Minister confirm that any increased funding provided by the UK government for supporting asylum seekers in Wales will go mainly to these designated dispersal areas which have borne the cost associated with the asylum process here in Wales? Well, we understand the UK government is committed to uh, funding the resettlement of refugees. We welcome that, and of course the money will be spent uh, for, that, uh, for that purpose. I, I have deliberately avoided using the phrase asylum seeker because that has acquired a prejudicial meaning in the mind of the public, and migrants, because migrants in the minds of so many means people who are moving in order to find jobs. These people are genuine refugees. They are no different from the people who are crossing Europe in 1945 in the aftermath of the Second World War. They are moving away from um, their countries of birth uh, through no choice of their own because of the displacement that's caused by war and by fear. And they are refugees in exactly the same way uh, as those people who had to migrate in the millions across Europe were in 1945. And that's why it's important that we make sure that the funding is made available and it seems from the UK government that it is being made available to help people with resettlement uh, and also of course to make sure that people are able to resettle and then of course uh, play a full part in the society that they've joined and we know full well that the experience of people who are refugees is that they they come to a place they are happy with the peace and security that that place offers them and they are enthusiastic members of society as a result. John Griffiths. First Minister, people in Newport, as with people elsewhere, are greatly moved by the tragedies befalling refugees, which obviously they see on the television and see in photographs in their newspapers. And they understand that we are very fortunate to live in stability and security and relative prosperity. And constituents have contacted me to ask whether any guidance will be provided as to the practical help they can provide as individuals, as communities, when people come from Syria and elsewhere, 
uh, and I'd be very grateful uh, if you could give me an indication as to whether that information will be presented to them. Yeah, I thank the member uh, for his question. It is something that we're uh, considering, uh, and one of the issues, of course, no doubt we'll, we will explore at the uh, summit on Thursday. I think it's worth emphasising, I've said this before, but I'll say it again within this chamber. Every single person who lives upon this island is the descendant of an immigrant. It's all a question of when our families came. Where do you cut off the, um, where's the cut-off date? Uh, is it after the Romans left, 1066, 1485? Is it after the end of the Civil War? Is it after the end of the First World War, the end of the Second World War? I mean, where is the cut-off date? At the end of the day, everybody on this island is actually descended from somebody who came here from somewhere else. Uh, we should remember that uh, in the reflections uh, that we have uh, in terms of the plight of the people we see uh, across Eastern Europe. William Powell. George Lowith. First Minister, as Wales moves to offer sanctuary to our share of uh, Syrian refugees, do you agree with me that health boards across Wales have a crucial role to play uh, in the contingency planning? In particular, uh, what support are you prepared to make available to Welsh health, health boards, um, notably in, in uh, parts of rural Wales, to ensure that they are well equipped to deal with the specific health needs of families and individuals, many of whom are fleeing unimaginable trauma uh, in the journey that they've made? Well, that's part of the pro I thank the member for the question. That's part of the process that we will be going through on Thursday. The first thing we have to do is to make an assessment uh, having listened to uh, our partners around the table of uh, what uh, needs to be done, uh, what the challenges are, uh, what the cost is, uh, inevitably, that much uh, is, you know, that has to be looked at as well. And once that assessment is made, of course, um, we can then move forward. I, I can say, um, with two members, that there will be a statement issued after the summit on Thursday, and I will, of course, ensure that members are uh, updated uh, from the summit and beyond in terms of what uh, we are doing as a government, what we, we have done with others uh, in, uh, in, in who are public authorities, and indeed what is being done in terms of working with the UK government. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I do welcome what the First Minister has said on behalf of everyone in Wales in terms of welcoming refugees, and these people are refugees. Now, following on from John Griffiths' question, I've received a number of inquiries from constituents who do want to help and want to offer accommodation and assistance of all kinds, and we now understand that Home Office guidelines are incorrect in their recommendations and refer people to organisations that aren't in a position to assist them. And although this issue is non-devolved, its impact in terms of accommodation, housing, the health service, education, is all devolved and is the government's responsibility. So certainly in light of the summit that you are to hold on Thursday, what the Welsh Government is going to do to ensure that provision is in place and that it is Welsh provision, a Welsh welcome which is in keeping with us as a nation. We want to welcome these people to our midst as has happened in the past as you have already said but that needs to work at a local level and jointly with local authorities too and I fear that the UK government at present hasn't fully taken into account the impact on communities and how we can build the humanity that people are displaying at present. Well it's important that we discuss that on Thursday as regards the guidelines themselves with the Home Office what sometimes happens is that they issue the information and the details and they refer people to bodies that do not exist in Wales. We've seen this many times before and then we have to ensure that those errors are resolved. I will, we will consider this on Thursday because of course it's exceptionally important that any guidelines available are relevant to Wales and our and Welsh structures. Anything Saunders? Well, I'm pleased to join the First Minister in welcoming the fact that the UK government has dedicated a billion pounds um, of the UK's international aid budget for councils across the UK. Now, the WLGA have written to you, First Minister, to calling for the launch of a national task force. What discussions have you had with the UK government um, in regards to the billion pounds? And also, how are you taking forward the request by the WLGA as regards the task force? It's on Thursday. 
Uh, the whole point is that in response to the WLGA, or partially as a response to the WLGA's uh, viewpoint, the summit on Thursday is being convened uh, in order to involve the WLGA. Uh, I'm grateful to her for the confirmation that the billion pounds from the UK government uh, will be spent to resettle refugees, because we haven't had that confirmation, I have to say. Uh, what is wholly unclear is whether the uh, money that's being allocated is for people who are already in camps in other countries in order for them to remain there, or whether the money is going to be made available to resettle people within the UK. Now, if she's saying that, that, that it is that, I welcome that, but certainly it's not something we've had confirmed at all by the UK government. And in a parrot. Sorry. First Minister, following on from Simon Thomas's uh, point, I too have had a number of people come to me and say that they would like to offer accommodation to refugees, but they don't really know where to go. Perhaps on Thursday, might you consider establishing a centralised Welsh Government database that people can register with to offer a place to a refugee here in Wales? I think that's an interesting idea, uh, and I thank the member for it. Uh, again, that is something uh, that we should consider as part of, uh, of Thursday's uh, deliberations. Uh, it is right to say that many people have offered accommodation to refugees. She is quite right. Um, and it's important, of course, to make sure that they know how to go about doing that. So I will take that uh, into consideration uh, for Thursday. Jenny Rathbone. Um I, I just wanted to clarify what um, aid, if any, the UK government is prepared to offer to enable us to give the warmest possible welcome to refugees so that we can uh, ensure that they get the health services and the schools that they need um, on arrival. We have nothing to fear from refugees because some of the most talented people in this country originally came as refugees after, during, uh, before the Second World War. So, um, but uh, uh, the UK government has not contributed so far to the um, refugees who've been brought centrally to my constituency um, those services are having to be funded out of other Welsh Government money and I wondered if there's any indication that that will change. Well, short of the declaration that the UK Government will provide a sum of money to assist refugees, nothing. As I say, we don't know whether that money is to assist those already in uh, refugee camps, in Lebanon in particular, where one in four of the population of Lebanon is in a refugee camp now. Uh, there are over 600 refugees in Jordan as well. We don't know whether the money is going to be... I mean, we saw the Prime Minister visiting these, these camps yesterday. He didn't make it clear. Is the money there to pay for people to stay in those camps? Or is the money there in whole or in part uh, to help to resettle people in the UK? We don't know that at the moment. We've not had full confirmation of that. If it is the case, that there will be money made available to resettle people in the UK. We welcome that. The money will, of course, be um, made available for the purpose uh, that it was intended in that regard, but we don't yet have that clarity. Again, it's because the UK government has not been swift in the response that it has uh, offered to the crisis that has been going over the past few weeks. Gwena Thomas. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you for your leadership on this most important issue, First Minister. Will Thursday's summit approve the role of the voluntary sector in this regard, and will this sector be a partner in the summit? I am thinking, of course, of sectors such as Shave That Save the Children, Children in Wales, it's Bernardo's, and the Red Cross, for example. Well, their contributions are vital, of course. We know that the voluntary sector can help and deliver many services to people and so we wish them to be part of the plan in order to assist people to come to Wales. I have no one else. We now move on to question five. Sandy Muir. First Minister, will you make a statement on your recent visit to Japan? Yes, could I refer the member to the statement that was published, I trust, earlier today? And it was. Uh, th thank you. The new jobs and investment which are being created as a result of our links with, Japan, Japan, with Japan are to be welcomed as they further evidence of what the Welsh Labour Government's initiatives to promote Wales around the world. It helps businesses to grow and our tourism market to expand. Japanese companies clearly have 
confidence about us here in Wales, but we recognise that there are still challenges to the Welsh economy, as drawn out by the Bevan Foundation uh, uh, report recently, because of unprecedented public spending cuts um, and the deep recession. So, First Minister, what assessment have you made of that report? And would you agree with me that we are developing the skills, the resilience and the competitiveness which will al allow us to innovate and to continue growing our economy? Well, I, I'm aware of the uh, Bevan Foundation uh, report. I mean, two things. First of all, uh, the Japanese economy uh, is now looking uh, more than I suspect over the past, that it has for the past decade at overseas investment in a way that hasn't really happened uh, in that decade. And it's something that when I met with, with companies like Hitachi and Sony uh, and uh, Toyota, it was made clear to me, Panasonic, uh, that they are now looking more than they have in recent years at uh, investment, and uh, Wales is well placed to benefit from that investment. We saw, of course, uh, the announcement with Sony. Skills are everything, absolutely everything. There was a time in Wales, late 80s, early 90s, when uh, investment policy or investment strategy was, was based on bringing companies to Wales on the basis that our pay rates were lower than anywhere else in Western Europe. Now, <laughs> that disappeared in the late 80s. When the Iron Curtain came down and companies who are pursuing low labour costs would just disappear around the world. And we need not compete in that market anyway. What we want is to make sure that our people have the skills that uh, investors require. There are two questions I'm always asked uh, by investors. A, EU membership. And B, do you have the skills flow that we need in order to be able to be sustainable and successful uh, within Wales? And of course, increasingly the answer to that is yes. We can point them to often to companies like themselves who are already succeeding in Wales. And that's why, of course, we've made such a heavy investment in apprenticeships and in schemes such as Jobs Growth Wales. William Graham. Standing officer. Uh, noting what you say, First Minister, uh, you will know it's nearly 45 years since Sony made their first major investment in Europe in Wales. I know that the UK Foreign Secretary visited Japan just a few weeks after you. Were you and his departments variously able to coordinate to make sure that Wales is the destination of choice for Japanese investment? Well, it's, it's not the Foreign Secretary who uh, really is uh, the person that we coordinate with. It will be UKTI, particularly on the embassies. And I have to say that the support we get uh, from British embassies abroad is exemplary. Uh, the, work, the working relationship with UKTI is good. Uh, we are looking to base uh, our uh, Japanese office in the embassy, but there is an issue regarding the, the rent the FCO wants to charge at the moment, but of course elsewhere around the world we've done just that. There's, there's perfect sense uh, in, in doing that. Uh, and so we do work with UK government agencies such as UKTI and we do receive um, significant support from embassies abroad. Simon Thomas. Uh, is, uh Thank you, Presiding Officer, and your written statement makes reference to a number of significant and important investments in Wales which have emerged from Japan, and you've just recognised one of the reasons for those investment skills, yes, but the other reason, we're on the doorstep of the EU, and membership of the European Union is crucially important to Wales. Will you confirm again, therefore, that you will campaign with me and others to ensure that Wales remains within that union, whatever your new leader may say? Yes, I will. I haven't changed my stance, and our membership of the European Union is vital to the economic health of Wales. Question six was grouped with question four, so we now move to question seven, which is Lynn Eagle. First Minister, make a statement on the 21st Century Schools programme. Yes, uh, our £1.4 billion investment in this programme is benefiting over 150 schools in 22 local authority areas across Wales. Uh, in the second year of a five-year programme, final approval has already been given for work to go ahead on 77 business cases, representing 51% of the overall programme. Thank you, First Minister, and I'm delighted that the programme remains on track. Since the launch of the programme in 2010, Torvine Council have worked assiduously to secure funding, implement changes and to take forward the programme. Although these changes have not come without their own challenges, the Council have successfully delivered elements of the plan and children in Torvine are already benefiting. 
Indeed, building work for three new primary schools is due to commence later this month and will hopefully be ready to open in time for September 2016. First Minister, will you join me in commending the work the Torvine Council has undertaken on this programme and what assurances can you offer that they will continue to have support from the Welsh Government to take forward this excellent initiative? Yes, well, that support will remain, of course. Uh, we know that Torvine's approved strategic programme will see an investment of £81.6 million, uh, with Welsh Government contributing over £40 uh, million. And of course, we'll be aware of the uh, projects that have been approved to date. The biggest school building programme for many, many decades, no question about that. And I'm glad that the children of Torvine are benefiting from the work that's been put in by Torvine Council and, of course, the, uh, the funding that we are making available. Nick Ramsey. First Minister, I'm sure you will agree with me uh, that the brand new Raglan Church in Wales Primary School in my constituency, which has been part funded by the 21st Century Schools Programme, is an excellent example of the Welsh Government working in partnership with a well-run local authority. Isn't it now time you reconsidered the latest ill-thought-out local government reorganisation plans and allowed councils like Monmouthshire County Council to get on with the job of building first-class new schools for its young people uh, without in interference in the structure of local government that would harm that process. Why is Monmouthshire Council in special measures for education? That's not the strongest position to ask a question uh, regarding the only local authority in Wales that is run by the Conservatives and it's in special measures for education. You know, I welcome the fact that the school has been built, but I, I would remind the member, I mean, he, he was, he was uh, generous enough at the beginning of his question to, uh, to thank uh, the Welsh Government for uh, its investment. He, he cleverly turned it into a question on local government reorganisation. But I, I would remind him, of course, that England doesn't have a school building programme. So Raglan, if it had been in England, wouldn't have had a new school at all. Alan Roberts. Prima Nido again. First Minister, although each of us will have examples of new schools being built, I do think that I must correct Lynn Eagle. The programme, of course, is slipping way behind in terms of the original intentions and in considering the review during the autumn where it seems that the funding available to the Welsh Government will um, decrease once again. Is it your intention to expand the program given that the finance minister said in november of last year that private monies will be invested in the program in stage two which is to commence in 2019 well first of all the member states that the program is behind schedule well it's not at all it's a five-year program we're in year two and more than half of the program has already been completed and so I don't see that we're behind schedule during this two years in what is a five-year program but of course it's true to say that we await to see the financial settlement from the UK government we're not very optimistic as regards what that will entail but we as a government are uh, proceeding with the scheme as it stands to ensure that more and more children have uh, these excellent schools. Uh, we now move to item two, which is business statement.